Hi, my name is Gerd Gauklitz. I'm the head of the SCAR clinic in the Department of Dermatology, Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, Germany. Today I would like to talk about pathomechanisms underlying excessive SCAR and current uh, and emerging treatment strategies that are presently being used to improve hypertrophic scarring and calloids. Excessive scars form as a result of aberrations of physiologic wound healing and may develop following any insult to the deep dermis, including burn, injury, abrasions, surgery, piercings and vaccinations. By causing pruitus, pain and contractures, excessive scarring can dramatically affect patients' quality of life. Excessive scarring was first described in the Smith Papyrus about 17 before Christ. Many years later, Mankini and Peacock differentiated excessive scarring into hypertrophic and calloid scar formation. Per their definition, both scar types rise above skin level, but while hypertrophic scars do not extend beyond the initial site of injury, calloids typically project beyond the original wound margins. Nevertheless, clinical differentiation between hypertrophic scars and calloids can be problematic. This may result in inappropriate management of pathologic scar formation and occasionally contributes to inappropriate decision-making related to elective or cosmetic surgery. Also, there are clinical similarities between hypertrophic scars and calloids. There are some clinical, histological and epidemiological differences that suggest that these entities may be distinct from one another. Hypertrophic scarring usually occurs within four to eight weeks following wound infection, wound closure with excess tension or other traumatic skin injury, with a rapid growth phase for up to six months and then gradually regresses over a period of a few years, eventually leading to flat scars with no further symptoms. A hypertrophic scar is usually linear if following a surgical scar. Calloids, in contrast, may develop up to several years after minor injury, may even form spontaneously on the mid-chest in the absence of any known injury, persist usually for long periods of time and do not regress spontaneously. Calloids appear as firm, mildly tender, bosolated tumors with a shiny surface and sometimes pale angiectasia. The color is pink to purple, both lesions are of commonly puritic, but calories may be even the source of significant pain or hyperesthesia. The following slide is summarizing the differences between calories and hypertrophic scars. Incident rates of hypertrophic scarring vary from 40% to 70% following surgery to up to 80% following burn injury, depending on the depth of the wound. Caloid formation is seen in individuals of all races except albinos, but dark-skinned individuals have been found to be more susceptible to caloid formation, with an incidence of 6% to 16% in African populations. Hypertrophic scars and calloid are equal in sex distribution and have the highest incidence in the second to third decade. It is critical to point out that calloids tend to recur following excision, while new hypertrophic scar formation is rare after excision of the original hypertrophic scar. In the majority of cases, Hypertrophic scarring develops in wounds at anatomic locations with high tension such as shoulders, neck, pre-sternum, knees and ankles. There is anterior chest, shoulders, earlobes, upper arms and cheeks have a higher predilection for calloid formation. The concept of a genetic predisposition to calloids has long been suggested since patients with calloids often report a positive family history unlike those suffering from hypertrophic scarring. In a recent study, 
linked it to various chromosomes for Kedoids. Disease has been described as demonstrated on the slide. Also, a genetic association between HLA status and the risk of developing calloid scarring Caucasians has been reported. Calloid growth may be also be stimulated by various hormones, since some studies suggest a higher incidence of calloid formation during puberty and pregnancy, with a decrease in size after menopause. The physiologic response to wounding in adult tissue is the formation of a scar and can be temporarily grouped into three distinct phases inflammation, proliferation and remodeling. Immediately following wounding, platelet degranulation and activation of the complement and clotting cascades form a fibrin clot for hemostasis which acts as a scaffold for wound repair. Platelet degranulation is responsible for the release and activation of an area of potent cytokines, which serve as chemotactic agents for the recruitment of neutrophils, macrophages, epithelial cells and fibroblasts. Recruited fibroblasts synthesize a scaffold of reparative tissue, the so-called extracellular matrix or ECM, Modified fibroblasts, so called myofibroblasts, help initiating wound contraction. Once the wound is closed, the immature, immature scar can transition into the final maturation phase, which may last several months. The abundant um, ECM is then degraded, and the immature type 3 collagen of the early wound can be modified into major type 1 collagen. The transformation of a wound clot into granulation tissue thus requires a delicate ba balance between ECM protein deposition and degradation. And when disrupted, abnormalities in scarring appear, resulting in either calloid or hypertrophic scar formation. Within the last years, the role of TGF-beta has gained specific interest as key mediators in the early stage of scar formation. The TGF-beta family consists of at least five highly conserved polypeptides, with TGF-beta 1, 2 and 3 being the principal mammalian forms. TGF-beta 1 and 2 are one of the most important stimulators of collagen synthesis and affect the ECM not only by stimulating collagen synthesis, but also by preventing its breakdown. In contrast, TGF-beta 3, which is predominantly induced in the later stages of wound healing, has been found to reduce connective tissue deposition. Indeed, a study by Shah and colleagues found that dermal wounds of adult rats healed without scar tissue formation after injecting a neutralizing antibody to TGF-beta 1 and 2 into the wound margins, compared to controls. Multiple studies on hypertrophic scar and calyte formation have led to a plethora of therapeutic strategies in order to prevent or attenuate calloid and hypertrophic scar formation. Preventing uh, pathologic scarring is undoubtedly more effective than to treat it, thus avoiding all unnecessary wounds in any patients, whether calloid or hypertrophic scar prone or not, remains an obvious but imperfect solution. Since delayed epithelialization beyond 10 to 14 days increases the incidence of hypertrophic scarring. Dramatically, achievement of rapid epithelialization is mandatory for avoiding excessive scar formation. Particularly, wounds subjected to tension due to motion, body location or loss of tissue is at increased risk of scar hypertrophy and spreading. Thus, in case of cutaneous injury, the goal of for rapid priming closure of wounds under little to no tension cannot be overstated. Pressure therapy has been the preferred conservative management for both the prophylaxis and treatment of hypertrophic scars and calloids since the 1970s. Nowadays, 
pressure garments are predominantly utilized for the prophylaxis of hypertrophic burn and scar formation. Bilicum gel sheeting is or has been a um, well-established management of scars since its introduction in the early 1980s and its therapeutic effects on predominantly hypertrophic scars have been well documented in the literature. Silicone sheets are recommended to be worn for 12 or more hours a day for at least two months beginning around two weeks after wound healing. Silicone gel is favored for areas of consistent movement where sheeting will not conform and should be applied twice daily. Flavonoids are found in well-known topical scar creams. Quercetin, a dietary bioflavonoid, has been recently uh, shown to inhibit fibroblast proliferation, collagen production and contraction of keloid and hypertrophic scar-derived fibroblasts. Imiquimod 5% cream, a topical immune response modifier, is approved for the treatment of genital warts, basal cell carcinoma and actinic keratosis. Based on the contradicting data regarding the success of Imiquimod in the prevention of post-surgical keloid recurrence, is used, its use remains questionable. A recently published milestone study by Ferguson and colleagues on the prophylactic effects of TGF-beta-3 on skin scarring has further increased the current interest in the TGF-beta family. In three double-blind, placebo-controlled um, studies, intradermal avutamine, that is recombinant active human TGF-beta-3, using different concentration what was administered to both wound margins of 1 cm full thickness skin incisions before wounding and 24 hours thereafter and the more than 10% scar improvement in nearly two-thirds of wounds could be achieved. Moving on with therapy of keloids and hypertrophic scars. It is critical to notice that generally most of the here mentioned therapeutic approaches may be utilized for both hypertrophic scars and colloids. Nevertheless, clinical differentiation between um, hypertrophic scars and keloids is central before the initiation of any treatment, particularly before starting any surgical or laser-related manipulations.